Good morning, folks. Welcome to Got Your Back, live stream edition. Morning after an Oiler loss to the Detroit Red Wings. We'll be joining Jason Strudwick in just a moment. Yeah, one of those games, hey, Oiler fan? Oilers should definitely be able to beat the Red Wings, but sometimes... Sometimes you just don't get the bounces that you need. Oilers had lots of opportunity last night, uh, but ended up dropping a point. The other day to Montreal, now to Detroit. Not ideal in a tight playoff race. Got your back brought to you by Mr. Dirk, located just off White Avenue and 102nd Street. Mr. Dirk is your one-stop shop for all your clothing needs, all of them. If you're a businessman, want to look sharp at your next meeting, now they got a wide selection of fantastic suits, shirts, ties, shoes to help you make that statement that you are on top of your game. Lots of casual clothes as well. Jeans, shirts, casual shoes. Everything you need to upgrade your wardrobe, go see Sterling and Dan and the great staff over at Mr. Dirk, just off White Avenue and 102nd Street. All right, we're going to check in this morning with Jason Strudwick. Struds, can you hear me? I got you, big guy. Oh, one sec, Struddy. Small problem here. Where are you? You got me, buddy? Oh, I got you. Oh, there you are. Okay, good stuff. So we don't have your uh, your pretty smiling face this morning. You're having some... Uh, some computer malfunctions of some sort. So your punishment, <laughs> your punishment for having garbage hardware study is I get to pick whatever pictures of you I want. That's your punishment. That's fair. That's fair. I've earned it. You have. So we've got you in a tracksuit and a helmet that looks like it's bursting at the seams. That helmet barely hanging on for survival. Oh, there's one of you uh, back in your other days. Um, once again, the helmet looked like looks like it's barely hanging on. Oh, that one, you look about 19 years old in this one. Nice full yeah, head of hair there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, full head of hair. Uh, life right in front of me. Now I'm halfway <laughs> there, according to Terry Ryan. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then we got the Fabio picture when you had the big, long dreads. You're in the... Actually, looked like you are wearing not a bad suit and shirt combo with the long, flowing locks. When was that one? Do you even remember when that I, one was taken? It looks like a red carpet photo. I believe I was in uh, Hungary. I was uh, went to Hungary, arrived there looking that good, and changed the face of Hungarian hockey forever. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, so I called a late audible this morning. Uh, you don't have my video strut, so you can't see me, but I was going to wear a hat. So I had a hat on the whole morning while I was preparing. And then I pulled it off, and I was like, oh, whatever, hair's not too bad, I'll leave it off. Uh, but I'm realizing just now that I've got this, you know how sometimes when you're wearing a hat, you take it off, you get that giant red line right across your forehead. I got this big, bright red line right across the middle of my forehead. So I got to decide whether to throw my hat back on subtly or just let it, let her buck. I don't know. Good choice. (laughs) Hey, by the way, last night I was walking, so I was walking out of the rink with Gene Principe last night after the game. We park in the same area, so quite often Gene and I will get a chance to walk and chat uh, a little bit. And, like, Gene, I mean, Oiler fans and Gene, like, they are, they're all over him. Uh, you know, they, they love him. He's so good with everybody, too. Like, he, he always takes time for people, and he'll take pictures and stuff like that. Uh, more than a few times I've been asked to hold the camera and take pictures uh, while Gene and I are walking out. So I'm, I'm taking picture of Gene and all of his fans. Uh, but last night, Struds, we were walking out together, and over my shoulder, I hear someone go, oh my, oh, G- Gene Simmons, Gene Simmons, <laughs> <laughs> Gene Simmons, like not once, but twice, and uh, Gino and I had a good laugh over that one. You ever been mistaken for anybody uh, for anybody else, Struds? Oh, yeah, I, I get it all the time. I used to got, I get this guy I, I coach with, Paul Manning. People always say, like, hey, coach Paul Manning, like, I'm Jason Strudwick. Yeah, although he's a pretty good looking guy, so it's not the worst thing to have happen. <laughs> there you go. Listen, we are live streaming the podcast this morning, but because Struds came in on the phone, I had to use some of my resources to get him in, so I can't monitor our comments today. So Struds, you you're going to be in charge of the Weiss Johnson mentions today, uh, so you can monitor the feed. 
Um, I don't know. You, I think you can click into the live stream and just follow along, read out any comments that you think are relevant. Um, I think we're up on YouTube as well. So uh, by all means, send us your thoughts. Struds and I are going to get to a couple things today. We're going to break down the game from last night, uh, discuss what we saw. We'll talk about Jack Campbell, talk about a few other things. In our uh, takeaway segment today with Sure Buick GMC, I want to talk a little bit about Dylan Holloway. Uh, his deployment, his overall big picture, the way he's been used, and what the outlook looks like moving towards the playoffs. So that, and then, I don't know, maybe we'll talk a little bit of trade and such because it's it's that time of year. So let's get to the breakdown of last night's game brought to you by DLR Vinyl Products. They supply some of the nicest maintenance-free decking and fencing products out there. If you've always had that wood fence or the wood deck in your backyard and you're feeling like you're just dreading the idea of having to paint or stain or sand or all that stuff that comes with wood products, uh, strongly consider going with maintenance-free vinyl from DLR Vinyl Products. They've got locations in Calgary and in Edmonton. That's my brother's company. Rick runs the branch here in Edmonton, and Rob runs the branch out uh, in Calgary. Rob was in town a couple of days ago, Struds, and we went to pick up my son from the airport. We had an hour to kill, so we went to the outlet mall there. You been to the outlet mall out by the airport there? Oh, yeah. I have a long time, but it's been, but I have, yes. There's some decent deals. You to, something nice? Yeah. Well, the, the, the great thing is, is, um, Rob and I are the same size. Like we wear the same size clothes. So he bought a couple of really nice shirts. Uh, we went to Under Armour and I love Under Armour. Uh, we, he bought a couple of really nice shirts and, uh, I drove him back to our place and he hopped in his truck the next day and went back to Calgary and left the shirts here. So, you know, if you're listening, Rob, thanks for the new shirts. Like, I, they're already <laughs> hanging in my closet because I don't know when he's going to be back. I don't know when I'm going to see him again. There's no way I'm just letting two nice Under Armour shirts sit in a bag in my office. So I've absorbed them. They're now part of my wardrobe. <laughs> That's a good way to boost your wardrobe. Yeah, exactly. It's good having a brother. And every time I go see him, I, I see if I can leave his house with one one at least one piece of clothing from him. Uh, that's the joy of having brothers. Okay, enough of this nonsense. Let's get to the Edmonton Oilers' loss last night to the Detroit Red Wings. Um, Struds, maybe I'll just get your kind of headlines on what you think went down last night. The team felt that they played pretty good overall and didn't get a result. You? Yeah, you know what? I think that they had a, a not to start, maybe they like the first half of the game, I didn't think they were buzzing. And then I thought the second half, especially in third, they really got rolling. I don't like to pinpoint specific players, but I thought that last night, Campbell let this team down. There was a few goals I thought were either soft or stoppable. You can even tell by the way he reacted after the goal went in that he knew he had to have that one back. So I think that Jack Campbell would feel uh, badly about the way he played last night. The rest of the group was okay, and especially really good in the third. Uh, but I, I do think that this one could be a little bit goalie-focused. Yeah. So let's let's dig into the goals that you're talking about. The the one nothing goal on the power play, Larkin was at the side of the net, and Campbell just kind of came off the post in a bit of a weird position, right? So generally you don't want to blame the goalie too much on on you know giving up shorthanded goals, but to me, he wasn't stressed in a way where he shouldn't have been able to stay in position and, and have that save. He wasn't pushed in a way on that play that he just, he just made a mistake, I think, rather than being forced into one, which, you know, sometimes goalies get forced into making mistakes. But I thought that was uh, kind of the architect of his own undoing there. Yeah, no, I think that's a goal that he probably want to have back. He was, he was in an awkward position. Um, and I think even Larkin was a bit surprised that went in. The Mata one as well, uh, pretty clean shot off the draw. Um, is that the other one that you were thinking of? Is the 4-2 goal there? Yes. Yeah, Onamata, that one, I, I, I thought he saw it. Now, we can talk a lot about face-offs, and I think that's an area that we have yeah. to address. Um, but when you look at that goal specifically, just, just the goal, not, not even leading up to it, um, again, I think he had a pretty good eye on it. Uh, kind of goes to his right, and you can see by his body language, he kind of puts his head down like, ah, yeah. i got to have that one. Yeah, for sure. So earlier on in the year, when Jack Campbell had that really tough performance at home, You'll recall, Struds, he came out in front of the media and he just absolutely dove on his sword, called his own play pathetic. Uh, it was a jarring comment that he made. I kind of was like, whoa. I mean, it, 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 he was just being so hard on himself. And that's the book on Jack Campbell. 
That's the thing that Jack Campbell needs to work on. When things aren't going well, don't get too down on yourself. Stay with it and, and keep grinding away, right? So he didn't have a great night last night, but we're going to go to the Weiss Johnson sound box here because I want you to hear what Jack Campbell said after the game. And you tell me, Struds, but this strikes me as a guy who is coming out having to fight against his own instinct to be hard on himself and trying not to make the same mistake again. Here's Campbell. Yeah, just frustrating night. Uh, I thought the guys played a tremendous game in front of me. Uh, a couple, you know, tough ones uh, to give up tonight. But, you know, things have been going really well lately. Don't want to uh, lose the momentum from one game, but we'll, I'll definitely look at it and, and move on. What do you think about that comment, Struds? Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit different. And he... You know, when you're unsettled, you're maybe not sure about how you're feeling. You're, you're going to stay, be hard on yourself. And I think he's more settled now about who he is. Um, but we should note there was a huge save, a huge save he made in the third period to keep the game tied. And I think, you know, that's what a team needs. Sometimes they can let a few bad ones in, but they need that key save uh, at a key moment. And he delivered that moment. I think he can take that away as I was there when the team needed me the most. So we were sitting there watching the game. I was with Greg's and uh, and Tommy Gazzola. And when he let in the 4-2 goal on that clean shot, I said out loud, time for the other guy. And the reason that I said that was because what I was watching was a team that was working to get itself back in the game, a team that was bringing enough to get itself back in the game and I didn't know how many times they could afford to let the goalie have a tough one go in. And I said, I was watching, I was laser focused on Woodcroft. He was looking down at the monitors and I wondered, is he going to do it? Because that would have been the time to do it. Your team has been fighting its way back in. That's the second soft one your tenders let in. I believe at that time, was it, was it four goals on 14 shots by then? Might have been. Yeah. And, and I thought, swap them out. Now, the risk in doing that was you get a goalie who's been playing well for you and whose confidence is building again. You give him a, you know, you pull him and you don't know what that's going to do to Jack Campbell. I thought he should have pulled him in that moment. That was my instinct just based on that game study, but he stayed with him. And then Campbell made that fantastic save that changed the game and kept his team in there. So, in the end, I think he probably made a good decision because he didn't risk wrecking the confidence of his guy, and the guy did come through for him and bounce back. I was thinking that at 4-2. Were you? I, I thought they might pull him after the end of the period, going into the third period. That You don't want to embarrass the guy by pulling him uh, mid-period. I think they got through the second. I was sitting there wondering, like, hey, I think they're going to pull him out here. Um but to Jack's credit, he, he shut the door, at least in the regulation and overtime before they tried the shootout uh, and made that big save. So I, I think that mentally, I think that'd be a really strong um, kind of boost of confidence for Jack Campbell moving forward. Yeah, they stuck with him. And and he um, he came through for them and made that huge save. So I uh, my instinct was pull him. Jay Woodcroft decided to stay with him. In the end, good decision by Jay Woodcroft because Campbell had a chance to come through. Let's uh, listen to Jay Woodcroft's assessment of the game. There were a couple moments within the game where we were uh, the architects of our own chance against. And, um, you know, we, uh, we gave up two goals off faceoffs where we iced the puck prior to um, the faceoff goal against. So uh, there's areas for us to, to get better. Uh, Struddy, talk about the icings and the lost faceoffs because you know this wasn't just on Campbell, and I think I like the way that Woodcroft put it there—the architects of their own mistakes. So you look down there at the end of the night. I always check out faceoff percentage. I want to see where where the guys ended up and who was hot and who was cold. And for the most part, the winners, you know, they're kind of where they expect. You know, Leon is just under five hundred. Connor is just over five hundred. Um, you know, Ryan McLeod had a pretty good night, but. Uh, sometimes it isn't the overall body of work. It's understanding the moment. So neutral zone face-off to me has very little value compared to a D-zone face-off or an offensive zone face-off. And losing D-zone face-offs clean, as others did regularly uh, yesterday, that's a really hard part. To me, it looks like Leon isn't able to win him like he wants. He's, he almost put his, his arms forward or stick forward instead of bringing him back. 
Um, and then others are just, I think they're trying to win them clean. And a lot of times when you're at a tough night in your own zone for face off, just tie, just go for a tie. Let your wingers, your demon jump in and get your fight to, to, to turn into a fight. So that, that is, I, I, I don't always think it's not the, out of a hundred face offs, it's those five or six that are in your zone that are so crucial. The builders seem to lose kind of repeatedly, even on the, at the end of the game in the power play in the offensive zone, they're missing or losing clean face offs. And so now you have to skate all the way to get it back and try to attack and score. One of the ones he lost to, uh, he came blitzing around the back of the net and heading up ice full speed, clearly wanting the puck, didn't get it. Um, ended up being an icing. Pretty sure that was one of the ones that ended up in a goal. Loses the draw, and it ends up in the back of the net. But let's discuss icings. The Oilers are playing a certain style right now where they're trying to stretch the ice out, Struds. And that means they're trying some pretty hopeful long passes at times. It's just part of what they feel they need to do to pick apart the opposing team's defense. And I think there's a ri- there's a certain amount of risk that comes with that. You might be a team that's prone to icing it here and there. If you're missing guys or if they're not quite hitting the spot and getting a stick on it, I think we're seeing, it feels like we see a lot of icings from the owners. I don't know what the stats say. It feels like we see a lot of them. Um, but there were a couple last night that ended up being costly. And, and I see it as just a risk with the, the, the type of system that they want to play. Yeah, it is. I mean, if you're stretching, trying to stretch out like that, every now and then it's gonna you're gonna lose it, right? You're not gonna have the puck. But one of the bigger challenges I find is that when you're stretching ice like that, and the reason you do that is to be back and to open up, hopefully find some open ice underneath that. But when you stretch out so far, if you zing it all the way up like 100 feet, 150 feet up to the to the wing or the center, he's sometimes standing still, or B, he's by himself. Right. Or I guess C, even you just tip it in, you got to go back and get it. I, w- I would rather have a little bit more of a puck possession type focus where you, you, you're you able to get it low and you can skate it up to the neutral zone and have some attacking speed and hold that puck. And, and they do at times, but when they stretch out like that, that, that's the problem with that setup. So, yeah, there are many outcomes, but I don't really love any of those outcomes, quite honestly. Either the good part is the puck's out of your zone and you're now in their zone and it's harder than the score. You've been wanting Leon Dreisaitl to be moved back to the middle more consistently. Um, they did it last night. Now, Vinny D'Arnais ended up with a flu bug and wasn't able to play in that game. So they went back to four consistent lines last night. There wasn't a lot of mixing and matching in that game. But it, Dreisaitl ended up largely at center. Jan Mark on one side and was it Evander Kane on the other side. <clears throat> Excuse me, just let me double check that. Yeah, Vander Kane on the other side. What do you think of Leon back in the middle consistently for the game? I've been talking about this probably for mm, two, three days now. You have. And been. I think that he needs to get back at center. I think that he puts there when he's there. I think he puts more on his shoulders. He's um, takes more control. Not that he he defers to Connor, but I mean, as a winger, you can't control the ice like you can at the center. So I think it's as we're leading up towards the playoffs here to watch, I think they have to have Leon at center playing at his best and then figure out who his line leads are. I'm guessing it's going to be Yamamoto and maybe Kane. Um, but I believe that that is something they have to have. I know they've been 11-7, but even under 11-7, you can still have consider Leon a center on his own line. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I, I hear you. I mean, he needed to get his feet moving, needed to be driving that line. Um, when he and McDavid are out there together quite a bit, when they're going great, they're unbelievable. When it starts to die off a little bit, some things sneak into his game that I think I agree with you. He needs to definitely needs to try and kind of exercise some of those bad habits out of his game, you know, when things aren't going well. And I think I agree with you that center ice is more the spot, uh, to try and do that. Struds, go ahead and, uh, pull a couple of, uh, comments and mentions. We'll get to the Weiss Johnson mentions and sound box 45 years they've been in the business so if you need a new furnace garage heater air conditioner hot water tank or any of those things serviced weiss johnson is definitely the place to go they got some good specials on right now too if you uh, get a new furnace air conditioner or heat pump installed in february you will get 500 bucks worth of gas cards which comes in handy And anybody who even gets an estimate for a furnace, air conditioner, or heat pump, they will be entered into a draw for a pair of tickets to an Euler game upcoming. Struds, what do you got for us, buddy? 
Yeah, Ed, Mike Dursa says, uh, hey guys, does it feel like we're heading into a precarious position where both of our goaltenders play is in a tailspin? Tailspin feels early for Campbell. That definitely feels early, but I could understand trepidation from Euler fan because Skinner definitely isn't getting the results that he was before. The quality of play hasn't been as high. And then when you see Jack Campbell have a night like he has last night, I could definitely understand how there's some nervous energy there, Struddy, for Euler fan. Yeah, 100%. And I think that um, you got to give these guys a chance, though, right, to, to figure it out and sort it out. And, you know, it's, it's for Campbell, it's one start, I think. And then Skinner, it's maybe a, a little bit of softness. But he's, he's also had some good games in there. So let's see what happens moving forward. They have two um, really quality points coming up this weekend in, in, in Rangers and Avs. I expect both players to be up and energized, not that they're not for every game, but I think it just dials it in when you look at who you're going to be playing at. So let's review this after the weekend and see if it's still the same situation. Yeah. Any more uh, mentions you want to go to there, Study? Yeah, this one is kind of what we just talked about, but from uh, Shane Canamary says, uh, what can we do to help on face-off? 97 uh, clean loss on the second goal, 29 clean loss on the fourth goal, last three minutes with two minutes PP and two icings. They lost every face off, not just spots, but clean. So, force can't even help to get the puck back. It is as simple as focus. And, and I, I touched on a little bit, but, it, but what it is, is sometimes it's not about winning it completely. You have to come to your wingers and say, hey, man, I'm not feeling it tonight. I'm going to try to tie this up and let's jump in and try to help me out here. And same right. with the team, man. Um, and if you're, because if you're trying to win a clean and you're not feeling it on a, on a, on a tough night with the uh, face off, it, it can go really bad. And those are all really good examples of, of clean losses that do affect your team significantly. 100%. Uh, i got to pull in a comment here off of YouTube. Reaper says, CeCe keeps hitting the puck off the glass. Dry went and chased the puck into the zone. Iced. Looked, uh, looked defeated. I understand uh, McDry's apparent comment of needing a good puck mover, uh, needing a good puck mover back there. Um do you think that fundamentally they don't have enough quality puck moving from their blue line? Or do you think fundamentally they need to defend better? If you had to pick one or the other, Struds, better puck moving or better defending, which would you inject into this decor? Well, first off, I'll, I'll take a simple answer. I believe I'd put Broberg and Bouchard out with McDavid and Drysaddle more often. Okay. Now, I know that a challenge uh, may be a challenge defensively, but those two guys are built to play with them, right? That's that's what they want. They want guys that can move the puck up to them, skate the puck up to them. So that is that is my number one. I'd probably move it over um, to have those guys out there. I, I do think they'll transition the puck is a big deal for the Oilers. I think getting that puck up and on the tape of the forwards in stride, it makes a big difference. And, and that's what forwards crave. You know, CC that is in his game. Nurse can, can do it. Uh, Kulak, okay, and, and I think the other three are, that's what they do. Uh, but unfortunately, the other three, I don't think get it on the ice enough with those top two lines to, to really have an impact for them. Yeah. I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot about this blue line the last little bit here, and just wondering, like, as Broberg and Bouchard were on the ice together last night, Struds, and this is going to sound like I'm being hard on them, but I, I'm not, because they are where they are in their development, but honestly, Darnay comes out, and so it's Broberg and Bouchard as the third pairing. I was looking at thinking, if the Oilers get to the third round of the playoffs, and they're on the road, and they gotta, they don't have, they can't protect these guys and protect different matchups. And you're talking about playing them more with McDavid. That means the other team's, you know, best guys are going to be out there more often, at least defenders. Mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I think this team is too much in a Stanley Cup window to look at that third pairing and say, yep, that's going to do. Get in, get us into a Stanley Cup final and that will hold. And I'm not trying to be hard on them. Broberg is brand spanking new. Bouchard's regressed. Um, man, this team really needs to add and have a much better second pairing than they do and create some competition in that bottom pairing. I just... They just don't seem to me to have the juice to compete deep into a playoff run if that's your third pairing. Is that fair or is that too hard on them? Well, I think they're young. I mean, between them, do they have 100 games, 150 yeah. games? Yeah. Um, and, and I'm looking at, you know, like down the, you know, it is now, but I think 
for the Oilers, they need these guys to develop and become top four defensemen. They, they need these guys to be that because they bring an element of offense and, 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 and ability to move the puck that maybe other players don't have right now on this team. So I think they could be higher end. Than, I mean, Barry moves the puck well, but I think the other three, I think these guys should be able to move the puck better as they move through their career. Yeah. Back to the East Johnson mentions here. Uh, Jason says, can you guys touch on why in the world number 13 is anywhere near the starting lineup? Nobody wants him. There isn't any trade value. No point in showcasing. Uh, so listen, I, I think there could be movement on this today. And if you're listening to the podcast later in the day, hopefully, hopefully it's not too dated here. 12 o'clock is the deadline for the orders to make a waiver move. You have to think Yamamoto is going to be ready to go. And so something needs to give on the salary cap on the roster front. And so today could be the day where Pooley RV ends up on waivers. Um, and I'm not sure, Struddy, like, you know, he scored a nice goal the other night. Uh, but th- those moments with him are just so few and far in between. My guess is if Pooley RV goes on waivers and ends up down in the American Hockey League, that maybe there's a trade that happens after he clears waivers and after he's been assigned. But I don't know that he's getting yeah. taken. You know, I've been, I'll keep my same position. I said last weekend that Ken Hall's not going to be forced to do anything until he's ready. And, and he knows it's the right decision. Um, you know, there's a lot of people, he was going to be on waivers last Friday. Well, here we are Thursday, the next a week later nearly, and, he, and nothing's changed. So I think Ken Hall is going to make sure it's the right move. Um, maybe it's today. Uh, I, I have no idea. But I, I really think that he'll do it when it's right for him. And if the yeah, will have to sit a little bit longer. He'll sit. Yeah, because it looks to me like he's been ready to go, and uh, and when he does come back, potentially see him starting a little bit up the lineup. You know who I thought really showed well for himself, and maybe dodged a bit of a bullet here. I'm not positive that that Warren Fogle wasn't at risk as well of potentially the waiver wire. And I know people might think I'm nuts for saying that because Pooley Harvey seems like the obvious one. I don't know why. Just my gut said that he he wasn't necessarily free and clear. But he's been healthy scratched a few times recently. Uh, but I thought he played really well last night. He got elevated up the lineup, got put into Yanmark's spot on Dreisaitl's line. I thought he, he pushed pace. I don't know, Struts. He looks like a guy who consistently understands the situation he's in and what he needs to be bringing to make it really tough on coaches and management to make that big move involving him. No player wants to hear they can be put on waivers, right? It, you're getting put on waivers because the team doesn't value as much as everybody else on the group, right? And that's hard. You know how humbling that is? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. In my career, I was lucky. I never was put on waivers. Um, and you know, I'm not bragging, but I mean, I was, I was very fortunate. I probably came close a couple of times, but I wasn't. Um, and I didn't want to because it's, it, it, you feel, you know, unfortunately like a failure because it choosing everyone else over you. So I think he's had, you know, he understands that. And when he plays with pace and gets to the net, gets the four check, shoots the puck, um, it, he, he's an effective player, but he's got to be consistent with it and bring it every single shift, not every couple of periods, every shift. And when he does that, he can find his way moving up and down the line a little bit. But yeah, he's he's coming. You know, I thought he could have actually goal last night, a pretty nice save off a rebound. But I, I think there's I think he's he's starting to understand that consistency is a key for himself. And his production this year, I mean, I'm just pulling it up here so I make sure I get it right. But he's played forty games and he's got seven goals. I mean I don't know. Uh, he's playing twelve thirty four a night. So everybody says, Well, you know, when they when he came over from Carolina, people thought, well, 15 goals would be a good year for Warren Fogle, right? Well, look at his pace. I mean, he's 14, 15 goal pace, uh, reduced minutes here at 1234 a game. So I think I think he's doing what he can with the minutes that he has, and he's showing a sense of urgency at the right times. Okay, that was the breakdown brought to you by DLR Vinyl Products. We're going to do a quick commercial break here, but on the other side, we're going to get into our takeaways. We're going to discuss Dylan Holloway, his handling this year. Uh, should he have gone down? Should he still go down? What do you need from him when playoffs start? Uh, stay with us. Lots more to come here on Got Your Back and lots more interaction with those following along on our live stream. We'll be right back. Checking in with Sterling Dirk inside the beautiful Mr. Dirk shop. People ask me all the time, who is the Mr. Dirk Sterling? I know it's not you. 
Who's the original? So my grandfather was a tailor and he came over to Canada in, in uh, 1940s, opened his freestanding shop in 1965. So Mr. Dirksen owed to my grandfather, he was a tailor. And uh, we keep that ethos of like quality service and uh, community in our embedded in our store every day. So if you come in, you walk in, you're gonna get a friendly face, a smile, and we're gonna get you suited up, head to toe, get you some jeans, shoes, whatever you need, we got you covered. 1939 is on the emblem and it means something truly local mrdirk.com is where you can see all of their merchandise or visit them in store right off white avenue and 102nd street hey strutty question for you have you ever tried putting in your own fence i sure have between uh digging the posts uh, mixed up cement and, and uh, digging the holes is absolute killer. It's brutal on the back. Well, listen, what if I told you you could put in a fence without having to dig a hole or mix any concrete? I'd be much more likely to come over and help you out. Yeah, well, you're not the first guy I would call, but thank <laughs> you for that. Listen, my brother's company, DLR Vinyl Products, they've come up with a system where you can actually put high quality vinyl fence in the ground without having to dig a hole, without having to mix any concrete. They can teach do-it-yourselfers how to do it, and they can also work with contractors who might be looking to start installing vinyl. It's super high quality product. The great thing about it is that it has fantastic longevity. You put it in, you don't have to worry about staining or sanding or anything like that. I've been lucky enough, Strutty, they put in multiple fences in my different yards and they've built me three decks. <laughs> I have totally well, abused yeah. the yeah. fact that my family is in the fencing and decking business, but it's great product. Uh, give Rob a call in Calgary or Rick a call here in Edmonton. This is a company my dad started. It's a family business. I'm super proud of it. That's DLR Vinyl Products in Edmonton and Calgary. All right, time now for takeaways brought to you by Sherwood Buick GMC, the number one GMC dealership in all of Canada, five years running. And it's the giant dealership just off Baseline Road on the way into Sherwood Park. They've got inventory. They're not one of those spots you go into and they don't have anything for you to actually get into and drive around. So they have inventory, beautiful lineup of trucks. The Sierra 1500s are fantastic. That's what I am currently driving, but they got the big SUVs as well. Whatever size vehicle you need, great used inventory as well. So go see Phil and the crew at Sherwood Buick GMC. Struds, if I were to ask you to sum up Dylan Holloway's year in a couple of words. How would you sum it up, my man? Gradual improvement. Gradual improvement. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think he has had gradual improvement. Okay, if you were to sum up the Oilers' handling of Dylan Holloway in, in a couple of words, maybe, I'll, maybe I should go first. Uh, I think I would say... Somewhat dicey. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, I haven't necessarily loved it. Um, you know, I think that uh, I got to the rink last night, and when I got the lineup sheet, and I saw Matthias Janmark elevated the lineup, elevated up the lineup onto Leon Drysidel's line, I thought to myself, like, what's he got to do to get a look, and not just a shift or two here or there because you're down three goals. What's he got to do to get a look with either of those top guys for any sort of time whatsoever? It just feels like, you know, there have been other opportunities to, to put him in that spot where his game has been at just a high enough level and there was an opening and Jay Woodcroft is very hesitant to put him into these spots. And I'm not sure why. What do you think, Struts? Well, I'll go back. I believe that he should have been sent down earlier. You know, like, you know, to start the year, even around, you know, before Christmas, I was pretty adamant on it. The challenge was, you know, there's not all kind of issues with injuries, right? So you, you, you can't send him down. You need him. You need him play. So you're trying to work him out. And he had, he had some challenges early on, understanding the speed of the game, just how smart NHL players are. You know, everyone's fast. Everyone's strong. Everyone has is, is, got hockey sense. Um, it's above what maybe you've seen in college or American Hockey League. Um, so for Jay, Jay's been pretty consistent. It feels like he's like a 10 minute night player, right? That's a four fine player. There's been some nights where he's bumped up and obviously when they, when Jay was just running, you know, five players, it, that was a problem, but he's got back to where he's at. I don't actually mind it with, with Dylan. I think that, you know, for Dylan, he's a young player. He's got to bring energy every night. Um, you know, anything around 10 minutes, he should be able to contribute. 
should he move up above? I think that he trusts a guy like Yanmark. He trusts a guy like Fogel more than Holloway because he's been around the league more. Um, there's, you know, when you look at it, it's not perfect because I think Yamamoto should be side and try to have him either Fogel or, or Yanmark. But unfortunately for, for Holloway, this is part of the growth as a young player. You have to kind of be patient and your, and your time will come. Struds, is it harder for a young player to develop when he's playing nine minutes and 35 seconds a night and he's the best player on his line every night? I think young guys need to be insulated. I think they need to play with players who are better than them, quite frankly, to sort of be shielded, but to learn and to up their level of play, right? So that that's as they're ready to take steps in their game, they're surrounded by guys who can help him take those steps and and play at the level needed when those steps are taken. I don't know. He's the best player on his line, and he plays under 10 minutes a game. I just don't know how that's setting him up to take the steps that you would want. If I had told you at the start of the year, Holloway's going to play 935 a night, won't really get anywhere near the top nine most of the time, and he'll be a fourth-line player this year, like, neither of us would have agreed that would have been a good path for him this year. No, I agree, but I think you have to take consideration the injuries. I really think that that, I, I think that he would have been down in the minors, but there's no choice, right? But I think, it, to be fair, though, also, like, you look at the line he was on last night, Holloway, McLeod, Fogel. It feels like they're trying to get that McLeod, Holloway duo going. And they have some good moments. There's no doubt they've had some good moments together. Um, so he's playing with another young player. You know, those three guys are all fast. I know the end mark moves around a little bit with Fogel, but it, it feels like they're trying to find the right spot for him. But inside of him, keep him feeling good about himself as he works through this first year of his career. Yeah. Man, I just, you know, doing what he's doing right now versus playing 21 minutes a night, top unit power play, every situation in the American League, I mean, he hasn't played a ton of hockey over the last three years. And I just can't help but feel that given the choice between 9.35 in the NHL and 21 minutes a night in the American League, that for how little hockey he's actually played, I just don't know if he's going to trend into the level that they would love to have him at. Like, ideally, Dylan Holloway could have been a fantastic ad April 1st this year. You know, where he was he was playing big minutes in the American League and, and scoring goals and creating offense and feeling confidence, and then you bring him up for the playoffs, and now you're adding someone to your lineup that's at the top of their game and confident and that young guy that's just feeling it. I'm not sure what they're going to be able to get or expect from Holloway as they head towards the playoffs here. I'm not sure he's going to crescendo in the way that maybe he would have, would have been able to had he spent the year playing more, mattering more, um, night in, night out. I agree with you 100%, but the fates wouldn't allow it, right? They, there was nothing they could do. So now I think I Ken Holland could... and Jay Woodcroft wouldn't allow it. I think that there's, you know, I understand what you're saying about injuries, and I think yeah, he probably yeah. would have gone down too, but those players got healthy, and those players came back, yeah. and I think Dylan Holloway's development should probably take precedence over, well, who's going to be the fourth-line left winger if we send him down? No, that, that's a fair point. But I, I do think that he would have been sent down and he would have been coming up. I, I, I thought he would go down November 1st and then would have been back, let's say, February 15th, somewhere around now. Like that, that was my, my dream world. That's what I projected for him, and that's what I think would have worked for him. And all those injuries happen, and then you kind of have him going and playing. It's, it's, it's not so easy to change and say, okay, we're, gonna, we're just going to send him down. Because he did start showing signs of life. And, and let's be fair. I don't think he's been that bad every game. I think there's been some really good moments, and he's, he's, you're starting to see it more often. Starting to get himself going, um, but now you, I don't. Really, I believe it's too late to send him down because you are you do need him, and he is a strong player that can skate. So I, I think it's just one of those situations where the it just the, it just didn't work out uh, the way you wanted to. So you and he and the organization have to figure this out. I think the message needed to be sent to the coach, play him 13 minutes a night or I'm sending him down. I mean, I think that's, I think it's on management to oversee the overall development of the player. And if you don't reach a certain minute threshold, if you're not usable to a certain degree in your rookie season and you're that important a prospect, I think there needs to be a threshold. And 935 to me is not that threshold. So um, 
I, I do think that at, at times this could have been and should have been handled differently, but I agree with you. He's, he's had some good moments. And he shows that he has good moments. And when he does have those good moments, don't you want to pounce on them? Don't you want to try and, you know, let him feel it a little bit and inject that confidence? And I, I wonder, Struds, if there's a hesitation to play him with McDavid and Dreisaitl because that hasn't gone well for some young players in this organization at times. <laughs> Yamamoto for a long stretch, Pool Yarvi forever. And I wonder if they're gun-shy because they feel like the spotlight is just a little too bright on that wing. But it feels to me like Dylan Holloway has shown on a few occasions that, listen, you have to live with the odd mistake. You're going to have to, but that he can make plays and play with those guys and just given a little bit of opportunity and confidence up there, maybe he could have grabbed a toehold, but he hasn't really been given that chance to grab a top eight forward toehold on this team. Yeah, and I actually, to be honest, I don't really have a major problem with that. Like, I think that it's okay to moonlight every now and then, but to put them beside there, beside those guys, those their expectations are you make plays. Not you hope to make plays, not that you think it's going to maybe work out every now and then. You make plays. That's the job. That's the job when you're on the top six lines, right? You're not learning. Yep. This group isn't here to learn. They're here to win and to, to do what they need to be done. So that is why I believe that he hasn't gotten that chance. His time will come. I, I think that we, we can see the flashes, and I expect a completely different and I should say that an upgrade is Holloway next year. Uh, a year in the NHL makes things so much different. You come back that second year, and you've been to every rink, you've played against every player. You know what it's like with, with playing with you know other top players and how the speed of the game is. You shift your training in the off season. I, I, I expect an upgrade in Holloway next year because uh, you can see it. You can see a good young player, but I think everyone has to be patient. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what they're able to rely on him for. Uh, in the postseason, you know, what kind of what kind of game he can find. And if, you know, these young players are so subject to the ups and downs of the confidence game. And if Jay Woodcroft was hesitant at times to lean into Dylan Holloway through his mistakes in the regular season, what do you think that's going to look like in the playoffs? So Holloway is going to either need to cut those mistakes out completely or Jay Woodcroft's going to need to figure out a way to give him a little more breathing room through those mistakes. Because when the stakes go up, if he's here, I think he needs to be part of it. But it'll be interesting to see. Struddy, solid podcast today, other than uh, not being able to see your uh, smiling face this morning, man. <laughs> I love it. I'll get this organized. Okay, sounds good. Oilers and Rangers set to go on uh, Friday night. We'll be dropping more podcasts here in the coming days. Thanks, Struds. I'll let you go, pal. Talk to you later. Okay, sounds good. All right, folks, that is going to uh, wrap up the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us on the uh, Got Your Back live stream presented by Mr. Dirk. And a big thanks to our sponsors, Mr. Dirk, Sherwood Buick, GMC, um, Weiss Johnson as well, uh, and DLR Vinyl Products. Uh, appreciate your downloads and your subscriptions. More podcasts coming your way. Have yourselves a fantastic Thursday. Cheers. Cheers.